It's often said that losing weight is the easiest way to treat sleep apnea. And while losing weight can help sleep apnea symptoms, the relationship between obesity and obstructive sleep apnea isn't as clear cut as many people think. So I sat down with my good friend, Dr. Audrey Wells, a medical doctor and board certified in both sleep and obesity medicine to find out more about the connection between your weight and obstructive sleep apnea. So Dr. Wells, I've got a group of questions here. I know you're an expert in obesity and sleep medicine as well as women's health issues. So I'm just gonna start uh, ripping off the questions and let's have a good discussion. Question number one, we know that weight loss helps with sleep apnea. In your personal experience and clinical experience, how effective can it actually be? You know, one of the reasons that I got formal training in obesity medicine is because there's so much overlap with obstructive sleep apnea and people who struggle with the disease of obesity. And I wanted to understand that better. And what I can tell you is that the problem with obesity is the number one risk for obstructive sleep apnea, but it's also unique in that it is a modifiable risk factor. Oh, okay. So people who lose weight mm -hmm. can reduce their AHI, which is the current measure for sleep apnea severity. They sleep better and they feel like they're more awake during the day. Unfortunately, problems with obesity aren't the whole picture for right. the vast majority of <laughs> cases. So I think this is one way where uh, obesity bias still exists, mm -hmm. even among sleep medicine docs, uh, also among bariatric surgeons, also among obesity medicine specialists. Oftentimes there's this communication that a person's weight is the sole cause for their obstructive sleep apnea. And most often that's not true. I guess what you're saying to me is it could be an adjunct and could be helpful in almost every case, but rarely is this the only thing that's driving this idea of having sleep apnea. That's right. And, you know, there's lots of benefits to weight loss. Sleep apnea is just one of them. So typically you can take your sleep apnea down by one severity level. So in cases where I've had, let's say, a mild case of sleep apnea, and I've had them drop weight, have you ever noticed that there's a particular amount of weight? Um, and have you ever gotten somebody from mild sleep apnea to off CPAP just with weight loss? Yes, I have. Um, so the more mild your sleep apnea is, the younger you are, and the more weight you lose, uh, all inform how likely it is that you will experience a sleep apnea cure with weight loss. You know, I, I think it's worth kind of putting this into context because the, the problem with obesity is extraordinarily complex yeah. and sleep apnea is just one component of that. Yeah, I totally agree with you. It's great to hear that you've be, uh, been able to convince people to lose weight enough to either get off the CPAP or to reduce in severity. And for folks to understand, if you went from a severe case of apnea to a moderate case of apnea, uh, that, that has tremendous cardiovascular uh, implications. It has tremendous mortality uh, implications. You're gonna be better longer when you go down in severity in sleep apnea, for sure. In addition to the weight loss, uh, which is something that we probably, assuming it's appropriate, um, we ask our patients to do, what are some of the other things that you've had success with? Yeah, so I think that CPAP, as we know it, is the gold standard and the most effective treatment for obstructive sleep apnea because it's non-invasive and yeah. it treats a multi-level obstruction. And a lot of people um, don't necessarily think of that. They think of it Great as point. just a tongue obstruction, but it's actually usually a multi-level obstruction. And that air stent of sleep apnea works really well to hold the soft tissues open up and down the uh, pharyngeal airway. In addition to CPAP use, I think people can also consider oral appliance therapy, which is a mandibular advancement de device. It's going to pull the jaw forward. And these are uh, dental appliances, they're precision fit to your upper and lower teeth, and the two pieces engage to give you that protrusion of the jaw. I love oral appliances, but one of the things that I've found is I found they work a little bit better more when I have patients with supine apnea um, in, in many instances. Have you discovered that as well? Yeah, it's true. And, and that's uh, probably because they work on the level of the tongue. So the idea right. is by 
getting that jaw in a forward position, you're pulling the base of the tongue forward. And that's a big player when you consider sleeping on the back. Yeah, and you know, one of the things I talk about with my patients is this idea of something called retrognathia, which I know you know what that is. So for folks mm -hmm. out there who may not know what that is, if you, if you take a look, you can see how my chin is in front of my lips, right? Well, for some people, their chin is actually behind their lips, which sets their jaw all the way backwards, which is, uh, as we were discussing, an oral appliance works perfectly because if your jaw is already set backwards and we want to move it forward, and unless we break your jaw, wrench the whole thing forward, which by the way, there are surgeries that do that. I don't recommend those, but <laughs> there are surgeries that do. This is where an oral appliance might be, might be really helpful. So I, I want to take a slightly different turn um, and I want to talk a little bit more about this weight, the idea of weight loss. There, there've been some new discoveries in the obesity marketplace. I, I I can't imagine anybody out there hasn't heard of uh, Ozempic and Wagovi and all these new weight loss drugs. Could you maybe give us a little bit of more information about what are these drugs, what kind of do they do, and then is there a place for them somewhere in sleep medicine? I, I think that uh, the short answer is yes, and I always kind of um, make a differentiation. I'm, I'm not a sleep apnea doctor, I'm a sleep doctor, so I treat the whole person. Love it. And yeah. I think when you look at a person's weight, that's a component that needs to be addressed. Now, the medications that have come out recently are really exciting because they offer a medicated way to have success that has not been possible before this time. So semaglutide or uh, Wagovi will give you about a 6 to 14% weight loss, depending on your dose and depending on how long you've been on it. And then there's a new one, uh, Terzepatide. We don't know what the weight loss brand name is going to be okay. yet, um, but it's been rolled out in the diabetic world as Monjaro. Right, right, and Monjaro. And it looks I like, that. yeah, and it looks like that one is giving you between a 15 and 20% weight loss. Wow. So these are significant numbers. Um, I think the tricky part is that in isolation, use of these medications can um, kind of give you a, a look that's different than what you want. So you may have heard of Ozempic face or Wagovi butt. And <laughs> what this is describing is a simultaneous loss of lean tissue in addition to mm -hmm. fat and sagging skin, which some people don't bank on. So I think that the medications for weight loss always have to be delivered to the right patient who's got their nutrition under control, they've got their uh, exercise going well, and they've got all the components that they need for behavioral change and healthy psychological practices. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you there. But you know, I, I have some patients, and I, I'm, I'm guessing that you do as well, they're just not good at weight loss, right? They, mm -hmm. They've tried everything out there. Is there ever a situation where um, you have a patient who you've put on CPAP and they're non-compliant, right? And you think if I could just get them <laughs> to drop about 20 pounds, 25 pounds, we could lower that CPAP to a range that might be more acceptable to them. Is that mm -hmm. even a hypothetical that could, that could be moved forward or do we really need more understanding of the drugs themselves still? I, I think that's definitely a possibility. And when you start coming down on your CPAP pressures, not only does CPAP itself start becoming more comfortable because you're not getting such a blast of air, but also alternative treatments like the oral appliance uh, therapy or even surgical treatments open up for you and are more likely to work with the lower degrees of sleep apnea. So I think these weight loss medications offer that possibility. Right. But again, on a backdrop of overall health and also with some lip service, hopefully, to the idea that it's not just your weight. It may be your anatomy. It may be your neurorespiratory control of breathing. It may be other medical conditions that put you at higher risk for obstructive sleep apnea. Yeah. And, and I was actually thinking along the lines of it, it could even be your hormones. Right. Mm -hmm. So we know that when women go through menopause, they have a greater likelihood of, of having sleep apnea. Help me understand a little bit more about that. I know that you're also a woman's health expert um, within the sleep field. And I, I feel personally that that's one of the areas that very few people have spoken up about. We really need more experts in this area. So thank you for all of your work that you do there. Help us understand when, when women are making that transition into, into menopause, 
and in many cases they are gaining a little bit of weight and may not have had sleep apnea before, what's the game plan? So I, I think there's three things that kind of factor in to increase risk of sleep apnea at the menopause transition. One, as you mentioned, is the weight gain. And it's super frustrating. I, I can speak to this personally because um, that is one of the things that sort of bookmarked the idea that I myself have been through menopause. The uh, other thing that happens is um, you have a a rebalancing of your hormones. So right. estrogen and progesterone go down. Those are respiratory stimulants, whereas testosterone is a respiratory depressant. Right. And so that change in your hormonal ratio is a risk factor. Mm. And thirdly, you know, sorry to say, but you're just getting older. I um, know, so right? You know, that sucks. <laughs> yeah, it does. And, you know, it shows up on our face in the form of crow's feet. We have sagging tissues in the back of our throat as well. And so at the menopause transition, women are kind of hit with all of these things that increase their risk for sleep apnea and sleep disruption, whether it be due to hot flashes or stressors or right, whatever. Right. So, you know, that's a tricky time in a woman's sleep life. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Now, um, let's look at other transitional times for women, let's say pregnancy, right? That's mm -hmm. another big one where sometimes we see women starting to snore during their pregnancy and, and in some cases even having sleep apnea, right? I, I would imagine that there's no universe where we would put somebody on one of these new weight loss drugs while they're pregnant. We would rather right. use a CPAP machine as an external device that does no potential side effects, get the woman through said pregnancy, and then kind of see what happens. Am I, am I close? Yeah, I, I think pregnant women are a subgroup that are really underserved when it comes to sleep apnea. So, you know, th there's a timing factor here, which a, a lot of the medical delivery system cannot accommodate. And as the, the fetus and the uterus grow, you're kind of impinging on the lungs. You get sort of this um, volume change, but also there's more blood volume. So a woman's mm. blood volume increases by a third wow. when she's pregnant. And so that means fluid is redistributed. That means there's more uh, swelling or edema in the upper airway, Got which it. increases the likelihood of uh, swelling or snoring and sleep apnea. But we it's hard to capture women at the time when they're uh, starting to bleed over from just primary snoring into the pathology of obstructive sleep apnea. And unfortunately, the studies that have been done on this group show increased rates of things like gestational diabetes, preeclampsia. You know, it's unfortunate, but um, getting a woman tested and then starting CPAP treatment can be tricky. Um, right. Luckily, when the baby is born, everything sort of uh, reequilibrates <laughs> and goes right. back to normal. But I always caution women um, when I talk to them about you know their childbearing years. Those those years are often associated with weight gain as well, which then kind of increase your chances of sleep apnea. So, in summary, here's what I gained. Please tell me if I if I got if I got it right. So number one, while weight loss is an important aspect to the treatment of obstructive sleep apnea, it's not the only one. Um, that's number one, it, it's a multifactorial diagnosis. Number two, that the drugs out there, while they may become helpful, are not the only thing you should be doing, but you should also have psychological counseling, you should have behavioral change, you should have exercise, nutrition, things like that that are kind of following up. Also, that many women in particular are not getting noticed for the potential of sleep apnea, and then they have certain times in their lives where this could actually be at a, a greater likelihood. Am I close? You're, you've got it. Yeah, that's for sure. Once again, uh, you know, Dr. Wells, I just want to say thank you so much. This has been a lovely discussion. I know I've learned a few things. Hopefully um, you have as well. And I know our audience is really appreciative. So thank you once again uh, for this lovely interview. My pleasure. Good to see you. Now, as Dr. Wells mentioned, while CPAP is the gold standard for sleep apnea care, there are actually a number of alternatives that you can explore. I've got a video covering all of those options that you can watch right here. My sincere thanks again to Dr. Wells for all of her time and her advice. I learned a ton and I hope you did as well. This is Dr. Michael Bruce, the sleep doctor, wishing you sweet dreams.